You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for February 8th, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where we are solemnly marking the 10th anniversary of the greatest presidential scandal of all time, Jacket Gate. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. The time you, you, you the story I remember broke. Remember where you, I was yesterday when you showed me the Daily Show reminiscence of Oh, Jack see, and Kate. that's right. That's and right. The Daily Show reminded us all that there was a time in which Republicans were outraged. Outraged, I tell you, mm-hmm. that Barack Obama worked in the White House uh, in shirt sleeves and not wearing a jacket in the Oval Office. That's right. It was a. And uh, by the way, this is back when Brian Williams had a regular job. Um, Mm -hmm. And he was reporting that the former occupants of the White House, so he was perfectly happy to carry Republican water on this story. (laughs) Everybody, this is, this goes back to an ancient um, point I made back in the early days of blogging, which I still stand by, which is um, the media has one font size. Yes. And that's it. And every scandal is that font size. So um, um, I'm reminded of uh, Harry Houdini. When he went to London, when he was first starting out, he he made a bunch of headlines in the United States and went to London and showed them all of the headlines he was making. And they were, of course, huge because Americans are loud and gaudy. And the Londoners were impressed by the size of the headlines because, wow, he must be someone important because look at that fucking font size. (laughs) And, of course, he was amazing, but it was just a matter of knocking people back on their heels because you chose a 77-point railroad font uh, to, to publish, you know, to publish under your name or, or the story being written. That is literally how the media covers stories. There's, yep. all, there's a bucket on the left for emails and Benghazi. And there's a bucket mm-hmm. on the right for all the treason and sedition and destruction and recklessness and nihilism and corruption and disaster and, and spying for Russia. And those two buckets have to remain exactly equal at all times. And the font size for each one has to remain exactly the same size at all times. So 10 years well, ago, that, that leads me to a question, just getting so deep into it so quickly. But yeah, let's go. What? Why then have we seemed to have forgotten in the media uh-huh. that Donald Trump paid one hundred and thirty thousand dollars to a porn star? Is it because there isn't an equal scandal on the left to balance it off? Because we have moved on, blue gal. <laughs> we have moved on. Um, because it's nothing that wing nuts cared about. I think I think that's it. I think the the conversation that the cable news media is having up until this point, perhaps, mm-hmm. is that there's nothing Donald Trump can do that's going to remove him from office, and we are going to speak for the thirty percent who are loyal to him, right? Because he quote unquote won the election, and we have no setting by which it's not the president right you know it's it's this insane person we don't have any setting outside of this power structure where it's a privilege to work in the white house right right? and so uh they they don't know how to be honest well they don't know uh, how in the face of horrible dishonesty they don't know how to examine their own assumptions and their own failings they simply don't uh I, you know, you know how much I love Malcolm Nance, right? Yeah. Love, love me some Malcolm Nance. But I do listen to him on uh, the Stephanie Miller show when he's on there occasionally and on other programs. And he doesn't do this all the time, but he does it often enough. And many other pundits, especially the never Trump pundits, do this. They talk about Donald Trump's base and Donald Trump's mm-hmm. supporters and Donald Trump's this and Donald Trump's that. They, they rarely, if ever, stray into the Republican Party. They yeah, don't call okay. it out by its true name because true names, as we know from Rumpelstiltskin, have <laughs> immense power. You have tremendous power, enormous yeah. power. To, if you can name a thing, you can own it. Mm-hmm. And there is a 
incredible reluctance still at this to this day because of what it says about them, because of what it says about media complicity and how we got here to point out that, no, it's the entire Republican Party from top to bottom and side to side. That's the problem. And we don't mean a minor problem, a glitch. You know, the, the tire pressure is a little low. Uh, the gas tank is a little low. Uh, no, this is a, an existential threat to this country. We've we've allowed this party, not we, not you and I, but the media has allowed this cancer to grow in full public view for decades and has studiously ignored it and, right. and have fertilized it, helped helped it along. Have, have said, remember, every time there's a Republican catastrophe there has to be some liberal something doing some some college campus somewhere so we can keep the buckets balanced in that environment they grew this monster Mm -hmm. and they're not equipped to say the whole party has to go every republican voter is complicit in this every fucking fake teabagger is complicit in this the entire fox news network needs to be kicked off the planet this is not something we can correct with scolding and wrist slapping which is literally all they know how to do Mm -hmm. They don't know how to point a camera at Fox News and the Republican Party and say, this is a hostile foreign threat to our country. It's lodged itself inside of our body and we need to get rid of it. What is the most efficacious way to get rid of it? Because that gets rid of half their sponsors, a third of their viewers, which is really all they care about. They don't give a shit about democracy. They care about ratings. And when you start saying all Republicans are terrible, terrible people. You end up very quickly in a conversation that precedes a civil war, not a commercial for hemorrhoid pads. And that's not something that anyone on the networks is prepared to do. It's the truth, Mm -hmm. but they're never going to – and the right knows this, which is why Donald Trump knows he can do whatever the fuck he wants. And Mm -hmm. the the media is not going to call him out for his hookers, not going to call him out for his – they're going to call him out individually, specifically, but they're not going to say, oh, my God. It's the whole Republican Party. It's Jim Jordan. This is why it's so important. This is why it was so important for us to win the midterms in the House. Yes. And why it's so important for us to continue to fight for elections in general, not just the White House, but everywhere. We are learning so much this month about the power of representation Mm -hmm. and how we're going to get into the State of the Union, how Nancy Pelosi's behavior behind Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. actually changed the conversation about hmm. the State of the Union. It did. How uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is changing the conversation because she's a member of Congress. She has a voice uh, and is newsworthy. Uh, and that changes the conversation. I want to get back just for a second to what you said about font size, because sure. I think there are times when we use that to our advantage in a very important way. I keep thinking about uh, the banner that Greenpeace put up right after Trump was inaugurated that yeah. said resist above Indeed. the White House in yep. huge letters. That wasn't just a statement about uh, the illegitimacy of the Trump presidency. That was a statement about all of us. And the attention that that sign got was a sign that things were not going to be business as usual. And we were not just going to be an ordinary uh opposition party that and this was something new it, it also points out the power of the spotlight and who controls yeah. the spotlight and who controls mm-hmm. the camera if that sign had been put up anywhere else right you'd if never you pasted a little sign in, on the gates right? right never have seen it and that's why the corporate media guards its privilege so jealously they mm-hmm. they fail us consistently and you know deeply corrupt way Every every time you see Hugh Hewitt on television, yeah, that's it's a, a fail. That's a fail. The corporate <laughs> corporate media deciding that we need to put this guy on for whatever stupid fucking reason we we have, but it's a corporate decision. While at the same time, they they whine about their First Amendment rights when Donald Trump attacks them. Right, you can't right. have it both ways. You're either a corporate interest pursuing your corporate interest to the detriment of of democracy, which is patently obvious, or you are a First Amendment institution protecting democracy in which case Hugh Hewitt has no business being on any camera anywhere and owning that space not letting anyone inside the perimeter who will say to people in power you have fucked up you people in charge you the owners of this corporation have fucked up so badly that we are at risk of losing our country it's your fault and pointing a finger at Joe Scarborough and saying you did this 
you mm-hmm. did this to us and yep. and pretending you didn't you only get away with it because nobody else has a platform right of, of equal size or equal strength and that's what blogging was supposed to do yes it was supposed to be this great democratizer yeah. right and and to a certain extent, I think it has worked in a yeah. way that no one kind of expected it to. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't turn out to be uh, Drift Glass is the equal in terms of huh. audience and access to the public sphere as Joe Scarborough. Right. But it did turn out to be a way of connecting all of us Yes, it did. Uh, to win elections, it did. to work for one another in far off places. I mean... Did you notice the the palpable excitement about the so-called retirement in Georgia 7 this this week? Uh, a congressman in Georgia 7 is, quote unquote, retiring. retiring. He, happens, he happens to be 48 years old. Yeah, he, he's, a, <laughs> he's, he's, he's a decade younger than me. Right. And he's retiring. And, and he's retiring. Yeah, no, he's running after, away. After one month in the right. minority, he's decided wanna, he's going to retire. I don't want to be in the minority. Majority uh, is so fucking awesome when you're in the House, especially, because you can just run rush, rush out over. And there's no control. As long as you are a member of a completely corrupt party, you yeah. are the, you're the cops and the court. You can do anything right. if you fucking want. And very much like the Bush administration during the height of Karl Rove's permanent Republican majority hubris back in 2003, mm-hmm. four, five. Um, there, there is a common belief that they will never have to pay for their crimes. Right, right. This will go on forever. This is exactly why they shoot their fucking mouth off all the time. And there's reason to believe that it's true because they have people on the right from Rush Limbaugh all the way over to David Brooks yep. Yep. have been so fucking wrong and shot their mouth off so badly and been scorched by reality so many times and have never been punished for it, never been held to account for it by anyone anywhere, that there's they have no reason to think that that's ever going to change. So why why wouldn't I, you know, why wouldn't Donald Trump um, assume that he's going to win in 2020? Why wouldn't the right just ignore reality? We've been, they've been ignoring reality for decades and nothing bad has happened to them. Yeah. There's been, you know, no, no Old Testament wrath has been visited on the people that put us in this position. They've gotten richer. They've gotten smugger. They've gotten older. They've gotten dumber. They've gotten more righteous and more ignorant and more arrogant and more willing to be openly racist, and nothing happens to them. But now they're in the minority, and they don't get to spend money anymore, and they don't get leadership positions, and they don't get to pick the choice committees to be on, and et cetera. It's, it's really, I think Lawrence has said, being a minority in the House is the lowest level of status in Washington, D.C. Well, now that they're in the minority, they want to talk about fairness. Fairness. And let's talk <laughs> about get policy. To that, but we're going to get to that for a minute. I, I want, just wanted to back up and say that the palpable excitement in social media over this mm-hmm. now being an open seat, Georgia 7, <laughs> it is as if we have all turned into junior dude. I know. You know it's like know. everybody gets where the flippable seats are. We all sort mm-hmm. of know. And uh, that is something that only the most uh, OCD people <laughs> knew yeah. 10 years ago. And I think we're all much more educated. And that's a result of the internet and social media. It is. So, it, 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 and us talking yeah. to each other and fighting with each other and yeah. and linking to each other like we used to. And having podcasts. And really, I mean, really understanding that flipping seats is what it's about. It really yeah. is. Uh, so Drift Glass, you titled this episode uh, beautifully. The title of this episode is Republicans Never Did This to Obama, which is a direct quote from President Porn Store Payoff yeah. uh, himself. This week's show is brought to you by our sponsor, Laudable Audiobook. They're the best audiobooks for only the best people. How do you get Laudable Books? You, you don't. don't. Laudable Books? No, you may not subscribe. Yeah, Laudable. <laughs> All right. Uh, and we don't know why they advertise with us, I guess, because it doesn't to cost show them off. anything and it's fake show off. and then they get to show off. Look, yeah. <laughs> half of the fun of, of having wealth and privilege is lording it over other people. <laughs> you know, that is, that is that is my takeaway from the New York Times op ed page. It's yep. like I can just show my ass all day long. And I get to go home to my mansion and my swimming pool and my um, my my trophy wife and my unlimited expense account. And it doesn't fucking matter. Right. So why wouldn't I just wave my dick around in public? There's no, there's no downside to it. So yes, that's why a laudable book advertises with us. Because fuck you. <laughs> because that's why. Fuck you. 
Mm -hmm. uh, let's applaud Stacey Abrams and what a fantastic yes. job she did. Uh, yes. She wasn't speaking to us, though, Drift Glass. No, she wasn't. No, because her speech would have been TikTok, motherfucker. That's right. It's <laughs> that's very it. short, to the point, <laughs> a lot of gestures. Yeah, that's it. But, mm -hmm. but she was speaking to a more general audience than uh, us angry liberals, and she uh, gave a speech that was about issues and hope and voting rights. Yeah. And uh, was uh, well received. And uh, apparently uh, it was primarily Republicans watching Donald Trump. And yes. then the rest of us turned on the TV to watch Stacey Abrams. So, yeah. Uh, do you have any other comments you want to talk about the State of the Union? Except uh, we kept no, thinking she... that Stacey Abrams was going to come on. And Donald Trump apparently talked for 15 hours, you know. Yeah. Just... Yeah. Castro length speeches. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, no, her context was important. She followed some old white guy wallowing in bitterness and self-pity for two hours, <laughs> um, which is not a good look for anybody. And she came right on and was just a breath of fresh air. Uh, one thing we did say, I don't want to forget, this might not be the place to put it in, but we'll put it in here. I'm going to put it in here anyway. The candidate we are looking for this year mm, yeah, is the Michelle Obama fist in the Barack Obama velvet glove. Yep. Yep. That's who we want. Mm-hmm. Um, mm -hmm. whatever candidate that turns out to be, that's who we want. We want someone who is, um, as intelligent and as, as charismatic and as thoughtful and compassionate and decent as Barack Obama, who will cut you and watch you bleed. If you fuck with people who are indigent, who are immigrants, who are minorities, who are poor, who are working class, who will stand up and hurt people mm -hmm. who try to hurt the weak and the helpless. And, That's and my, what we want. my pinned tweet over it at Blue Gal, mm -hmm. uh, I went a little Methodist. You were right. I did go a little <laughs> Methodist with this because I talked about your presence and your policies. And you're supposed to support mm -hmm. the Methodist Church if you're a Methodist with your presence as well as your money um, mm -hmm. and, and, and prayers. Uh, but my pinned tweet is our job as Democratic primary voters is to choose the candidate who can say with their presence and their policies the loudest fuck you to Stephen Miller's yes. racism and Tucker Carlson's misogyny. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and we, so that's what we're talking about. And, and, and as you say, it's going to have to have the velvet glove around that iron fist uh, mm -hmm. to be palatable to the news media, first of all, and yeah. to a lot of independent quote unquote voters, people who do not want uh, nastiness to be part of the picture. You know, everybody has to be yeah. nice all the time. Well, apparently Donald Trump was okay for some of them. Uh, but but we, I, need some, it, we need a also, fighter. We need a fighter. We yeah. need someone who can understand that there is no difference between uh, conservative media and the Republican right. Party. Right. They're the same thing. The, and so if you go after Fox News and you must go after Fox News to take them down, mm -hmm. to, to destroy them, yeah. Um, you're not going after the free press. You're going after an, a foreign powers propaganda machine that's stationed in this country mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's hurting everyone around it. Uh, and you have to go after the, the neutrals. You have to go after people who in the middle uh, who keep pretending that both sides are equally to blame and both sides are the problem. They are the structural enablers of everything that bad that happens on the right. Those people have to be uh, like we did on our little radio show when we were there talking about abortion on a college radio station, yeah. you, you got to turn on the moderator. Yeah. You gotta. You gotta, I'm sorry, but you have to do it. You have to, at some point say, Chuck, why the hell is Hugh Hewitt sitting here? He's a lying shit bag. You know, everything coming out of his mouth is bullshit. You got to know that you can't be that fucking stupid. So why do you keep putting liars like this on television and giving them a platform? Why Chuck? This is on you, Chuck. And I have, a, I, my suspicion is, the National Enquirer has a big file on Chuck Todd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a big file on Lindsey Graham and a big file on Susan Collins and a big file on Jim Jordan, because why not? We're just learning this week that the National Enquirer is a giant Republican blackmail factor. Well, and, and the National Enquirer's safe is the same as looking at everybody's yearbook in Virginia, right? Everybody's yeah. got yeah. a past of some kind. Uh, and may or may not have something to hide, but it makes you wonder when you when you realize looking at the behavior of people like Lindsey Graham, what the hell happened? What yeah. happened and to you, like, Lindsey Graham, that this, you know, and, turnaround? Well, and and to, to quote Sherlock Holmes, once you've eliminated the impossible, yes, right. <laughs> whatever's left, however improbable, must, be, must the be the truth. When you see, as as 
as I know from being in the private sector in many different capacities over the years, when you see someone suddenly behaving in ways that are completely um, destructive to the organization, counter to everything they've ever said before, and will look straight into your eyes and tell you a fucking lie that they know is a lie and you know is a lie. It'll do it behind closed doors. You know something drastic has changed. Yeah. I don't know whether it's, in Chuck Todd's case, blackmail from the National Enquirer. I don't know if his employers... I think it's just the suits upstairs. I think it's just, you know, it's much, much simpler than that, right? But that's the point. There is an explanation for it. Yeah. There, there is something out there that's making him do this or making them put someone into that position that is that manifestly horrible at the job and keeping them yeah. there, despite the fact that he embarrasses himself every time he opens his mouth. He must know that by right. now. Right, right. Chuck Todd at this point must know that he eats shit daily for to make a living, and everyone thinks it's a joke and a, and a yep. farce. He has to know yep. that. Therefore, there must be a re there must be a reason Lindsey Graham completely turned around. Well, and that's that to me is also very simple. They've got some they've yeah. got some gay sex pictures of Lindsey Graham someplace allegedly, and yeah. uh, you know they they've told him that we're going to primary you in the Senate, and Trump's going to campaign against you in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And he sees the writing on the wall with his stupid base voters uh, that yeah. he could lose. He could lose everything. So uh, I guess it just, you know, it to you and me, let me put it this way. You and I mm -hmm. have never been the kind of people for whom hosting Meet the Press is a pinnacle of no. accomplishment. No, <laughs> no. And, so, and I, I do want to modify yeah. one thing that we said just a few minutes ago. I never particularly wanted me to be the voice in the mm -hmm. media. Yeah. Yeah. But it's absolutely necessary that that there be a consistent um Steve Gilliard, yeah, Digby right. level, blue gal level, uh liberal voice, sane, rational, um extremely uh, intelligent, uh quick with the facts and uh compassionate liberal voice in the media yeah. and and the one voice that's consistently missing on purpose yep. from every fucking conversation on every fucking network with a very few exceptions is that voice. They do not want us there and they don't want us there for a damn good reason. And that reason is we would start talking about the shit that they don't want to That's talk right. about. That's right. Anyway, as you were uh, saying, well, I also wanted to do a little shout out to Bob Suska because you and you and he had yeah. a little uh, fight this week, uh, a family fight, no. family fight. Can no. I call it a family fight? Well, he, he, he misunderstood a broad general indictment. I laid out the feet <laughs> of our never Trumper friends. <laughs> With something that might be personally directed to him, and I listen to his podcast. Oh, a regular he's a podcast, wonderful and I, podcast. I we to love him being on his on a pretty show. regular basis. Absolutely, yeah. And and he got his shirt tail a little caught in uh, in his heel when it turned out Steve Schmidt uh, was exactly the same. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, he, he was someone who was disappointed by Steve Schmidt, and that's a lot of people. Yeah. And just because you were right on this one instance about Steve Schmidt doesn't mean that you were attacking. Obsesco no, for that. I mean, no. My my plea is uh, that Bob and I have some sort of made up public feud that we can <laughs> oh, both see, market yeah. as as Democrats in disarray. Oh my! And god. raise our media profile. Democrats are fighting. Oh my god! Well, here's the here's the problem with that. Yeah. Bob is, is is about as tall as I am, about twice as handsome, and he already has a high media profile. So if you have to punch oh, down a lot man. to reach me, well, he and so his would be me. Are, are very drop dead right. sexy. They are. I mean, we have sexy listeners also. Sure, but and he's <laughs> you know he's bi coastal. Yeah, uh, he's located and and so his he's already um there. And it would it would be uh, crass of me to suggest <laughs> that you, you that, wanted to have uh, a gigantic that, feud. He's the guy that we should have a guy feud. That hates Bob Seska. <laughs> right. Yeah. At no. no point. At no point when he are, and I are on a stage together, which will happen, is someone going to say, "Hey, who's that on stage with Drip yeah. Black? That's not ever, <laughs> ever going to happen. It's going to be so, that extremely tall guy who's taller than Bob Seska by a little bit. Yeah. But the the larger point was that we we think he's awesome and we enjoy being on his no, show. And I like enjoy that idea that you were here. might have been creating a feud with Bob Seska to raise your profile. Sure, <laughs> on purpose. Because that's just a sort of... No, because then he just... Like Rick Wilson, then he just blocked me. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we're recalling a article in a book I got for my high school graduation called The Harvard Lampoon Big Book of College Life. Yes. Which talks about how to impress women by... Yes. Uh, 
finding a rom- picking a random romantic poet and developing an intense dislike for that romantic poet so that when you're at a mm-hmm. party and somebody mentions Percy Blythe Shelley you throw your uh, drink miss. against the wall and scream first of all it's Miss Shelley <laughs> and secondly that son of a bitch <laughs> is and th- so and then you storm, you storm off. off and some girl cha- follows you to your dorm room and says are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't, don't want to be alone right now. now. <laughs> Somebody mentioned yeah. Shelley, that so-called poet. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, uh, harking back to the podcast notes, uh, we got off. Yes. On- oh yeah. We have notes. Don't we? Yeah. Tangent there. Uh, uh-huh. national Enquirer just story just broke last night. Oh my gosh. This yeah. is wrapped in yeah. so many layers. There's, uh, oh. Roger Stone layer. There's a Donald Trump layer. There's a uh, Ronan Farrow layer. Uh, it's it's remarkable. Amazon Jeff Bezos layer. Amazon, and I never needed to think about Jeff Bezos's private parts ever. I really didn't need no, to know nope. anything about that. But this is, as you put it in our notes, this is essentially a Republican blackmail rat fucking story. That's what it's about. It's yeah, as old as Nixon, that's exactly what it is. if not mm-hmm. older. Uh, and mm-hmm. the National Enquirer is a well-funded rat fucking institution. So um, yes. maybe let's talk about what rat fucking is briefly, and then and then talk about how the National Enquirer did it. Rat fucking is dirty tricks. Dirt, Nixon dirty tricks. Dirty tricks. Um, yeah. Uh, Don Segretti. Go ahead and look up Don Segretti. Um, Nixon. You know, it starts off harmless. You know, stuffing ballot boxes and college level stuff, and suddenly you're breaking into the Democratic headquarters. You're sabotaging the Muskie campaign. You're putting stuff on other people's letterhead. You're 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 deliberately criminally sabotaging your political opponent using whatever means are available to you and inventing them uh, where you have uh, where none exist. And didn't didn't uh, Karl Rove invite uh, motorcycle gangs yeah. to the, his opponents' rallies well, well, so that they would cro- create Lee, trouble? I mean, and, Lee Atwater yeah. was you know the king of the racist rat fuckers and Lee Atwater had a protege or two proteges named Karl Rove and George W. Bush. So this is mm-hmm, a direct mm-hmm. lineal descent into how the Republican Party has always operated. They have to cheat. They have to do this sort of thing. And so it is of no surprise that an organization that pays sources for dirt and is yes. deeply linked to Donald Trump and advancing Donald Trump's career going back decades would, oh, surprise, surprise, have a have a wall safe full of J. Edgar Hoover level blackmail material, uh, all stacked right. up and ready to go. Right. And anyone who steps out of line uh, gets a bomb dropped on them. And mm-hmm. the thing mm-hmm. that makes this one interesting that I did not understand until Rachel Maddow explained it to me is that uh, AMI, which is the name of the company that owns the National Enquirer, has an agreement uh, with Robert Mueller to not break any criminal laws of any kind for the next three years. And that is the condition of them not being prosecuted for all the things they pled guilty to. And if they if they step over that line one little bit, all of the things that they pled guilty to come right back at them. And as it turns out, apparently, that's uh, bad. blackmail and extortion <laughs> apparently fall into the category of shit you're not supposed to do. It's under the category of something yeah. was that the the uh, the prosecutors are ready to uh, call a bad and thing. And they went after right, Jeff Bezos because right. Jeff Bezos was after them saying, your method of operation is a political institution. You're, you're being used. You are employing yourself as a uh, as an, uh, a massive campaign contribution to Donald Trump by blackmailing his enemies. And there's right, value in that. Right. There's dollar value in that. And that makes you a criminal. Well, and they 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 were going to let, let's let's be mm-hmm. fair. The Washington Post was investigating right. AMI right. to see to asking the question, is this organization an extension? They should be asking the same thing of, of Fox sure. News. But ask, are they a personally paid and and financially benefiting mm-hmm. extension of the Trump campaign. Right. And that's that's legitimate journalism to look into the financial records and see wh- how are they contributing and making in-kind contributions to the Trump campaign, which they were doing with this, what do they call it? The the technique catch where and, you spike. Yeah, catch and kill. Catch and kill, yeah. right? They, right. You, you pay a source. Catch and kill stories of Donald Trump with porn stars and Playboy playmates, mm-hmm. right? And then and then bury so, those stories. Yeah. 
they buy them and right. bury them and they make the people sign a, a non-disclosure agreement to never, ever, ever, ever say a word about it. And they bury the stories and call it journalism. Um, you know, journalism isn't journalism anymore. Democracy isn't democracy yeah. anymore. And we're going to get to uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the power of storytelling, but campaign contributions ain't campaign contributions anymore. And that's speech. It's, it's speech. everything is speech. Right. So it's a giant story. Because it really is this massive, um, filthy, <laughs> dirty, um, rumor mongering uh, machine that you will find uh, mm -hmm. displayed prominently in every supermarket in America, practically, is a rat fucking machine that Donald Trump uses or is used on his behalf or, or to benefit him. Um, and they finally cross someone again, I, I, as I posted earlier this week, uh, probably yesterday, or maybe it was a month ago. Time is getting real weird on me here, Blue Gal. Um, it's, I, it's weird to me too. It's I'm shocked it's Friday the, by already. This the, uh, week. Yeah. It's too bad that uh, that nobody at the National Enquirer ever watched uh, The Dark Knight. <laughs> yes, <laughs> where, where, yes, you know, right. Where they tried to blackmail Batman. <laughs> Low level flunky decides to br blackmail Bruce Wayne. Like really, the richest man in the world who beats people up at night, and you want to blackmail him? Really? Yeah. Um, and that's exactly what they tried to do. And Jeff Bezos did an incredibly brave thing. Again, Jeff Bezos dick pics is not a sentence I'd ever thought I would ever construct no. in his life, nor would <laughs> Jeff Bezos, um, hero of democracy. Uh, right. But Jeff Bezos right. took every, he, he did what, you know, he, hang, he hung a lamp on it. He took all yeah. the bad shit that they were threatening to expose him, exposed it himself and said, here's yeah. what you tried to do to me, you sons of bitches. Now I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you hard. There's no place for you to fuckers run. And he exposed it himself. And 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 it cost him his marriage yeah. to do it. I mean, regardless of whether he was already going to leave for this mistress or not or whatever, yeah. uh, you know, this pushed things to the point where he had to tell his yeah. wife. So made him a legend though. Made him uh, a legend. He's a it, this this wasn't this wasn't yeah. nothing. This wasn't nothing for him to do this. You yeah. Know? And yeah. if Howard Schultz had ever done anything like that, I'd, I'd take it a lot more seriously. <laughs> you know, I really would. If he if he if yeah. ever if he yeah. ever staked his reputation and his fortune on taking a stand uh, against yeah. villainy yeah. and in favor of democracy in a not just because he does very good things for his employees. He provides them with health care and all kinds of good stuff. Yeah. But this is the sort of thing where you step back. I don't. I don't think billionaires will save us, but I really no. am heartened to see someone just take a stand and punch back so hard because I just got to believe that everyone involved on the other end has no idea um, the shit storm is coming for them because he, he, no, has, I agree he with has unlimited resources. He has all the time in the world. And he's going to take you right. apart molecule by molecule. And that will be a beautiful thing to see. Making millions of dollars a mm -hmm. minute and doesn't need to worry about anything. Right. If he ignores his business for a year, yeah. he's, he's fine. fine. Uh, uh, Drift Glass, I want you to talk about this local story because we had a local story from the local it's a Republican local Party. Republican Party. Um, was it a fundraiser? Was it a fun? It was a dinner. It was the Lincoln. It was dinner. the Lincoln dinner. It was the Sangamon the County Lincoln dinner. Sangamon County Republican Party. <laughs> Um, the Sangamon <laughs> County Republican Party, uh, and I wanted to put this in the context of, of taking a core sample of the Republican Party. Right, right. Um, which means all the way from the top. So you start with, you know, Donald Trump, then is he a hopeless criminal disaster? Yes, he is. Mitch McConnell, disaster. Paul Ryan and the entire Republican House, they're on display today. They're just horrible people all the way through. You take it down to the local level, and you find... That uh, the local Republican Party invited, as I titled it, infamous Iran-Contra trader and gun grifter, Ali North, as their keynote speaker. Mm -hmm. Ali North. And yep. uh, somewhere in the story is twice repeated. This is in the local paper, the State Journal Register, that Oliver North is controversial. No, Oliver North is a traitor. <laughs> He's not controversial. Uh, racism is not controversial. Selling your country out, selling weapons to terrorists, lying about it to Congress, funding an illegal war. Those are not controversial things. Those are war crimes and acts of treason for which Oliver North got off the hook through a technicality. But he's not a hero. And Oliver North has gone on to become the president of the National Rifle Association. So my local Republican Party invited the president of the gun slaughter lobby, which is a front organization, front group for Russia, as we now know, 
who's also a traitor and a war criminal, to come speak to their little group. And they loved him. Uh, and, and he came here to say certain things like um, an unnamed, an, un, a, a, an unholy troika of tyrannical billionaires was setting the Democrats' far left socialist agenda. They're using their vast fortunes to elect enough progressives to turn America into a disarmed socialist dystopia. The hard left in America are socialists. <laughs> they're anti-freedom candidates for every office. If they succeed in what they're doing, our lives are going to be adversely affected forever. Well, I, I hope yours is. Really do hope, hope yours is. But that's who the local Republican, you know, the reasonable Midwest, Repu this is who the local Republican Party turns to for inspiration. And what did local people have to say? Yeah, they loved him. And they all for me, the past is past, said yeah. uh, a guy named Ryan of Jacksonville. He stood up. He stood up for his country. He was a true patriot. He's done a really good job the last couple of years bringing some high-profile speakers and raising money to the Sangamon County Republicans. Tim Butler. Obviously, Oliver North was a controversial figure in American politics. Those of us on the Republican side have supported what he's done over the years. I think he's done a good job heading up the NRA. When I think of Oliver North, I think of Icon. Let's leave it at that, said Brian Bowles of Springfield. Another woman said, it's a huge honor just to see him and meet him and be in the same room with him and to thank him for all he did for our country, and on and on and on. That's what local Republicans, grassroots, friends and neighbors, people who live in your community think about a, a monster like fucking Oliver North. And that's why you don't need a special interpreter <laughs> to tell you what's going on inside the Republican Party. That's why every time I hear another never Trumper cop to being stunned and shocked and swear to God, they had no idea that the Republican Party was full of Republicans. I'm like, where the hell have you been? Just open the fucking window, go to any Republican event anywhere. And this is the sort of shit you're going to see. How did you? Oh, that's right. You're just lying. Oh, I get it. You want to be on TV and have a book deal, so you have to lie and pretend that you had no fucking idea the Republican Party that I have seen and known up close and personal for 30 years existed at all. Which means that for the last 28 years, you've been lying, right? Because every single Never Trumper in the media or in political action or uh, an ad maker or book writer or think tanker has, has, has uh, advanced themselves as an expert. In knowing what's really going on, you know they have deep, intimate, inside information that you need to see. That's why that's why they deserve a place at the table. If it's really true they had no idea what was going on inside the Republican Party for the last thirty years, then why the hell is anyone paying them for their opinion about anything? Period. Full stop. Anyway, that's the Republican Party down here at the grassroots level. That's who they are. Yeah. So let's not pretend that this is something that if you flick Trump away. The party is somehow going to become an enlightened Jeffersonian democracy. It's not. It's rotten all the way to the grassroots. And so all the way to the grassroots, it has to be burned to the ground. And the ashes need to be scattered across the ocean. And some new thing has to come up in its place. But the party itself is dead, long dead. And everyone in that room, I think, knew it. Yeah, I, I, it, was, it was pretty amazing how many of them who were asked for a quote for the paper that the first thing they said was, right. well, the past is over. <laughs> I'm glad to see him because well, he's such a patriot. And the, the acknowledgement in their tone that they are editing history and everybody's just right. going to let them do it and was, the worst was really remarkable. My local paper will say is that he's controversial. <laughs> That's right. Um, there was also right. a rather embarrassing to our community article in Governing mm -hmm. Magazine this this month. Yes. Uh, it is showing that the heartland, uh, Springfield, Illinois, Peoria, Illinois, mm -hmm. I think were the two big communities. I mean, when I say, when I say, yes, when I say big, Illinois. I they mean comparatively focus. big communities. Uh, yeah. Those are the second and third largest cities in in Illinois. Is that right? Uh, I think no. Peoria is bigger. Peoria is bigger than Springfield. I know. I think I'm not sure. I, my, my demographic okay. knowledge of the sub suburbs of Chicago is is sadly lacking, yeah. but it's close. Yeah, I think I think counting if you count Chicago as all one big thing and all the suburbs as just sort of metro Chicago, mm -hmm. the next two cities are Peoria and Springfield. Yeah, probably Champaign's right. in there too. Yeah, Champaign's in Champaign Urbana that group as well. Anyway, uh, they were, this article in Governing Magazine talked about how uh, Springfield and Peoria are very consciously segregated yes. uh and and in a in a visual map way 
uh, in Springfield, the 10th Avenue Railroad line mm-hmm. divides the city between black and white. Wrong, literally the wrong uh, side of the tracks. There is literally a, a white and black side of the tracks. Yeah. And uh, there is also, um, since probably the 70s, although I only moved here in 2008, but I believe it was the 70s, given the way people talk around here, mm-hmm. um, there has been white flight out of Springfield. Yes to um what used to be farm communities and are now becoming suburb suburban communities mm-hmm. uh white flight schools that have google power books you know every student has their own wired laptop in class mm-hmm. um white flight schools mm-hmm. and the inner city schools and and Again, those of you that live in major metropolitan yeah. areas listening to me, I'm sure you're laughing because Springfield has 120,000 people. Right. Uh, Springfield is but, the size of two wards in Chicago, which has 50 yeah. wards. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the high schools here, the public high schools in Springfield, there are only three of them. And I believe all three of them are majority minority students. I'm pretty I sure that's true. Right. Yeah. Um, and Southeast, where uh, the two girls in our family go and where Junior Dude also went, uh, is definitely majority minority students. Mm-hmm. Um, I We were having a talk after Sunday school last week with someone who is a new mom now. She had her baby this week, but she was uh, pregnant at Sunday school last week and she wanted to talk about schools. And uh, we were, t- I think dove right into talking about values and the values of sending your child to a public high school. Yes. Um, yes there is a payoff, you know, they don't have uh, a computer for every student in the class, right. like they do in some of the white flight schools. On the other hand, I feel as though um, my children, our children get a different set, a more creative set of expectations mm-hmm. in their life. They have a, a much more, uh, egalitarian worldview. Yeah. And I think I think they are more uh motivated in a way. They aren't just going to become insurance agents and middle class white people. I think when you're surrounded by white people all day long in some of these white flight schools, there's a sense of privilege that makes you not work. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Does that make sense? It, they're ready for you the know? world as it is. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. And they're also ready to lead the world as it is. Yes. And there isn't a sense of uh, kind of clickishness Mm -hmm. that you get in in some of these uh, white flight schools that that really bothers me. So um, that doesn't mean that everything's perfect. And I mean, there are fights in their schools and there's tension sometimes. Racial animus and there's. And there's economic as well. One of the one of the things that jumped right out was the economic uh, inequality between whites and blacks yep. in Springfield is, is the largest in the state, I think. Yeah. And well, and, but that to me was, that's why I wanted to bring this up yeah. is the newspaper, how the newspaper covered Nash, a national magazine covering Springfield. All of the headlines were about economic in, inequality right. rather than racial inequality. Right. And the point of the article and the headline and the cover story of the article was about racial segregation. And our local paper couldn't say that. Well, and you know what? So there is a local yeah. paper that could. Um, the cover story with the same cover photograph as Governing Magazine to the Illinois Times. Oh, the indie paper. Yeah. They did cover they did. it the right way. They did. <laughs> and Good. it's uh, it, a lot of the, uh, the the groups I volunteer with. It's on their Facebook page. And it yeah. is a. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen the, the IT yet yeah. this week. So. Yeah. Yeah, but good. It's, good for it's, them. And I had to admit to people that, yeah, no, I, I didn't see it on your Facebook page. I saw it because we subscribe to Governing Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> because I get Governing I'm Magazine that, as an editor of Crooks and Liars, yeah, right? We're that big. <laughs> we're that kind of nerds. Uh, by the way, just I, I don't work for them. I'll, 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 this doesn't come back to me at all. But if you're interested in municipal government at all and how it works yeah. on a really, really local level and understand just sort of what trade offs are there and the, the local politics. Uh, governing magazine is great. It is a really good magazine. And I don't know if you can actually subscribe to the paper copy unless you have some sort of connection. They yeah. they don't ship that out to just anybody, but their website's available to anybody. And Gov- governing magazine is a really good place to read about what government can do. Yeah. 
they're, yeah. they're a lot like yeah. laudable books in that way. You cannot subscribe to them, <laughs> but we can, cannot. and we'll pass it along to you we every can. now and then. We'll, 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 we'll laud it over everybody. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so uh, Virginia is for lovers of blackface, apparently. Yeah. Um, yeah. How embarrassing. Uh, but again, having lived in Birmingham, Alabama for 14 years, yeah. I got to tell you, this is not a shock. Shocking? Is it shocking to you? No, no, no it is not. Uh, there is... There is one kind of language and way of talking to one another that is very generational, mm -hmm. uh, where you can say that at home, mm -hmm. you can say this at home, you can joke around with your frat brothers this certain way, and then uh, you start talking at the city council meeting, or you start, e and this is this started in really the early '80s, uh, an awareness that. We are looking for the tourism dollar. We're looking for the convention dollar. So we don't talk that way outside. We don't use that as an outside voice because we know that that hurts tourism. Yeah. And so, uh, but that doesn't mean that the attitudes aren't the same. Um, we saw this actually a couple of weeks ago, uh, Martin Luther King Day, and you saw a couple of on-air personalities at the local news level mm -hmm. using a slur about Martin Luther King's Jr.'s name. Mm -hmm. Whoops. And I kept saying to all of my colleagues, like, oh, look, it's another one who said that. Are they are they crazy? Oh. I said, no, they've heard it at home for 30 years. Right. It's just a slip. That's how, that's how people, certain people, mm -hmm. uh, certain racist people with racist families. Talk. That's how they refer to Martin Luther King all the time. That's his name in their house. Well, and and this is there, and so, there's yeah. church language, and then there's home language, right? And right, and home language is racist, right? I mean, for a lot of people, for a lot of people, and and that's so, this is why every explanation that Donald Trump somehow hypnotized the Republican Party and turned them into monsters is bullshit. All yeah, he did was take bullshit. down that that very thin wall, that little paper yep. thin wall between public mm -hmm. voice and private voice, and say, you know what, right. For 30 years, this fucking party's told you, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, it's okay to be a racist. I'm telling you it's okay to be a racist out loud and in public. That's the loud only, and proud. That's the only thing yep. he did was give them permission to do what they were already doing, but do it in public. And every single never-Trumper knew it. They all knew mm -hmm. they were working for a racist organization. This is, what, this is the thing that bothers me. <clears throat> if we're going to hold Ralph Northam, I, I'm sure I said this last week, accountable – for his racist behavior in 1984, mm -hmm. and we should, then yeah. why aren't we holding people who worked for the racist Republican Party for the shit they were doing up until five minutes ago? Right. If they get to say, right. I've seen the light, oh my God, everything is blah, 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 is it wasn't before, Donald Trump, blah, 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 and let them, you know, run that fast little ramadula and pretend that they never had any idea, and they said they've suddenly become enlightened at the ripe old age of 52, then we have to extend the same privilege to Ralph Northam. And I don't think we should. I think he should resign. I think, frankly, every single person in Virginia should probably resign at this point. I think every every white person of a certain age and older should resign. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just do. And any, principle. And any <laughs> men who sexually assaulted women credibly should also resign, which means, yeah. basically, as I said last week, Rick Perry is going to be the governor of Virginia at some point. <laughs> uh, as the designated <laughs> survivor is like, really? It's me? Cool. Hey designated survivor who had an n-word at his camp yeah. oh that's right ramp, he can't right? be because he had oh, that yeah. Womp, womp. Womp, womp. yeah and this is one thing i want to remind people of is when things change sometimes they change very fast as well they should mm -hmm. or they seem to the ice melts for a long time that it breaks uh dan rostenkowski was uh <laughs> was run out of office and convicted of doing something that 10 years before he no one would have blinked at yep um that's yep. how and yep. rightly so what he was doing was corrupt he was you know the house uh the Borrowing scandal, you probably don't remember this. It was the it was the House Post Office. It was moving money around when he shouldn't. He was doing all kinds of you know corrupt corner cutting. I'm a, I'm a privileged, powerful member of the House for you know 25 years. I get to do this shit. Everyone just said okay, and then it turned out that wasn't okay, and he had right. to pay for his sins, and as well he should. Uh, but that's how change happens: real slow, real slow. Then suddenly, overnight, oh my god, they're looking at my yearbook. <laughs> Holy yeah. shit! I didn't know that was Let's a thing. Look at all the yearbooks. Yeah. Let's look at all the yearbooks. Mm -hmm. All right. We are running out of time, Drift Glass. Well, I, we should mention that Mick Mulvaney, before the State of the Union, was asked if the deficit was going to be discussed. And he said, nobody cares. Right. 
Mick Mulvaney. So this is shades of Dick Cheney once again. Dick Cheney had said Reagan taught us deficits don't matter. It's Mick and Dick. As he lined his pocket. Just remember Mick and Dick, Mulvaney and Cheney. It's all you got to remember. It rhymes. That's easy. It's, yeah. yeah. And, and so and when, I, when we have the deficit hawks come back, when Democrats are in power, and oh, we can't possibly afford Green New Deal. Oh, oh my God! Oh no. Look at these de- But look at these deficits. Oh my God! Oh, the deficits we, are so we, bad. We've got a crisis. We've got a crisis here. Mm-hmm. Nobody cares," said Mick Mulvaney right. before the State of the Union 2019. Nobody cares. And two years from now, Mick who? Never heard of him. I have no idea what yeah, we're talking right. about. Today on right. his radio show, Hugh Hewitt. You know Hugh Hewitt, NBC trusted contributor Hugh Hewitt mm-hmm. uh, called the Green New Deal communism. It's fascism, it's despotism and compared Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to dictators who quote end up murdering millions because that's a perfectly rational yeah, that's, and that's balanced thing to say. that's a good thing to say. Yeah. Well, but again, <laughs> I showed you a picture of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez walking into the State of the Union yeah. in her all-white suit with her guest mm-hmm. uh, and I asked you a question, I said do they know what's coming no, for them? And no. you, what, you had a really good long answer for mm-hmm. me about that. Well, we don't have time for that, Blue Gal. We got to move on. <laughs> Let's assume that I had something really clever and fast to say. No, you did. You, you said they have no idea. This is the the myth come alive for them. Right. This is this was you know. Oh no, what's up? On what's on the other side of the wall doesn't really exist. Right. And we are a permanent Republican majority. Nothing is ever going to happen. Right. We're, we're... And all of a sudden, you know, it's not the white walkers. It's the white coated women right. of the Congress coming toward you. This was never supposed to happen. This was never this was supposed never to happen. Never supposed to happen. Right. Yeah. And everyone yeah. acted as if it never would. And so we yep. never have to pay for it. We never have to. We never have to address climate change or racism or campaign finance or anything because none of we'll all be dead before any of this comes back on us. And now, holy shit, they're in the house. Oh, my God, they're here. Oh, my God, they have microphones. Oh, my God, they're in the majority. What do we do? Well, we just lie and lie and lie and lie and lie. And, and, um, and, and you know, recognize that Republicans never did this to Barack Obama. Right, never. Or Hillary never. Clinton. Never. Or this never Bill happened. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oversight hearings, Drift Glass. Yeah. Oh, God. That's, that was today. We're recording this on Friday like we always do. Um, Jerry Nadler, don't play it, man. Uh, neither does Hakeem Jeffries. Hakeem Jeffries just brought oh, the he heat said, today. This is your last week on the job. Don't you touch the Mueller right. investigation. Right. And ask, basically, who are you and how the hell did you get this job? <laughs> Someone on Twitter talking about Jack Nicholson and a few good men and like, you can't handle the truth. And it, and it was Whitaker saying, I'm too stupid to know the truth. <laughs> I can't tell him. you the truth. <laughs> I don't know anything. And very predictably, every one of uh, Donald Trump's stooges lined up mm-hmm. to wave their arms and make very loud noises with their mouths that didn't amount to anything or accomplish anything other than to show to anyone who was watching, to prove to everyone who was watching the liberals have been right about the right all along. Yep. There was Jim Jordan. There was Louis Gohmert. Doug Collins was there just absolutely shitting the bed on camera. Um, and yesterday, this is not just one thing. Yesterday it was Matt Getz. Remember Matt Getz? Oh my God. Who reminded us all that Florida really needs to be sent to juvenile detention for about 10 years until mm-hmm. it grows the fuck up. Mm-hmm. Um, who decided to insult um, Parkland shooting parents to their face, uh, asked them to be escorted from at the hearing. And uh, uh, I believe uh, said, no, we, the problem is not gun violence. It's the wall. The wall. And all of this, is, all this is, yeah, this is all signaling to an audience of one. It's a whole bunch of Donald Trump's little fascist foot soldiers in the house saying, we still love you, Donald. We're doing everything we can. Don't hurt us. Yep. Don't yep. turn your troops on us. We're still loyal. Yeah, we're in the bunker. Yeah, the Russian artillery is raining down all around us. But we still believe you can pull this out. Don't hurt us. Don't throw us to the wolves like you did other people. And that's all this is. These are a bunch of really, really horribly despicable people Mm -hmm. who absolutely accurately represent the Republican Party down to their toenails, getting ready to be shoveled onto the ash heap of history and are terrified, terrified they're going to lose their job and there'll be nothing left for them on the other side. Because who's going to hire Matt Guess after this? Right. (laughs) Where Where does Louis Gohmert go after the house? That's the pinnacle of his career, let me tell you. Now, slightly upscale, I, my understanding is that Susan Collins has gone into seclusion <laughs> uh, and is in mourning after discovering that uh, Brett Kavanaugh is every bit as big a lying asshole as everyone told her he was. And he lied to her about Roe versus Wade and about his 
judicial temperament and his philosophy. Yeah, because he, uh, he ba- and, I mean, I this is my interpretation, and people have different interpretations of what happened mm-hmm. yesterday in the Supreme Court. Yep. Uh, the Supreme Court voted five to four to stay the requirement that Louisiana wanted to put into place. It was just like the Texas requirement of yep. uh, abortion providers needing to have hospital admitting privileges in order to perform abortions. And that law was overturned two years ago. So mm-hmm. Louisiana is trying again. And uh, as I say, there are different interpretations. I read actually what uh Brett Kavanaugh wrote about this, and he's the only one that actually wrote an explanation of his opinion, apparently to suck up to Roberts or to do something. I don't know exactly why he wrote this, but the way I read what Kavanaugh said was, um, I don't see why we need to stay this decision when doctors have 45 days to get hospital admitting privileges. Let's see if they can do it first. Right. And it's like, oh, so we're going to make abortion providers prove by jumping through a series of hoops that it's Completely actually unnecessary a problem. Hoops. <laughs> Completely unnecessary. These are yeah. these are yeah. restrictions invented out of thin, thin air, air to, to make it to impossible. make it difficult and impossible yeah. to have abortion providers in the state. Exactly. And then say, oh, we didn't outlaw it. We just made it practically impossible to do. And so this we're not is right going up there it. with with weight lifting weights with squee. It's an excuse. Yeah. It's a it's stirring the mud. And uh, yeah, Susan Collins should be real fucking proud of herself. Let's just. And I believe way. you all have. I, I have a Twitter survey going. Is Susan Collins just too stupid to be a senator, or is she a liar? Yeah. So good question. Uh, you can vote either way. Go look it up on Twitter. Um, and this is something I really did want to spend at least a couple of minutes on. Yeah. Especially we're not going to have a news roundup. I just want to warn everybody. No. <laughs> uh, 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 Alexandria Ocasio Cortez put on a demonstration of the power of storytelling. She really did. Talk to us and about that. This is, on, cannot, this is on Twitter. It's up at Crooks and Liars as well. Um, uh-huh. She talked about bad guys. And what if you're a she bad did. guy, right? And she did. She conducted a writing workshop. Uh, she did. She really did. Um, and she sat down. And it's this is something that you can learn. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a skill you can actually learn. But you got to learn to do it. And it's how to tell a fucking story. Because, back, back up uh, just a minute, Drift Glass, because there's yeah. there's something else that's more important that is also sure. important to this case. Uh-huh. She t- she had the power of storytelling. She was telling the story before a panel of people who were interested and verifiably documented advocates for good government. Yeah. So she had common cause there. She had crew there. She had. She did. She had a panel of four pe- four people in front of him all have represented good government mm-hmm. organizations that does uh-huh. not happen if the congress is controlled by republicans they did Absolutely. not have any hearings for common cause while republicans no. were in charge of the house so no representation matters having democrats in charge of the house matters and then mm-hmm. you have aoc in the house on this committee because nancy pelosi knew how to wield power and she saw yes. this let's face it fundraising juggernaut yep. rock star young mm-hmm. energetic person and she did not put that person she did not try to overshadow that person she said right. aoc we will use you <laughs> as you know and now here comes the storytelling which well, which is just it's like watching a diamond form from coal, right? It, yeah, it, and under it's, pressure, it's, you get this jewel of a story. And and go ahead and tell us more about that. Well, and it's it's not just using her; it's it's they're they're acting in their in mutual self interest, exactly, exactly, in the best interest of the party. And the thing that bothers me immensely about about my Democratic Party and my liberal brothers and sisters is they do not know how to exercise power. power. Yep, they know how to do policy, great, but if they just had a tenth. Of Mitch McConnell's Machiavellian, cold-hearted, you know, lizard instincts, they they would go a long way. But but, God love them. Every time Democrats get power, this this applies to Barack Obama, who I would vote for tomorrow if he were running in any election anywhere. You give him the ball, he runs it to the fifty-yard line and, and puts it down. And says, "Okay, let's compromise." Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Mitch McConnell comes on. No, let's take it to the ten-yard line. Okay, let's go to the ten-yard. Oh, what about the five-yard line? And it. it it is like you don't fucking learn that you cannot negotiate with terrorists. Mm-hmm. You can't negotiate with these people. You can't give them anything. And 
and wielding power has a lot of different aspects. There's a procedural aspect to it. There's staffing committees. There's doing deals behind closed doors. And then there's telling the public a story, making the policy stuff you want to get enacted come alive. Mm -hmm. And what Mm -hmm. she did was she said, okay, here's the thing. I'm a bad guy. Okay. I want to be a bad guy. I got elected to Congress to be a bad guy. And some stuff I want to do. I want to get a bunch of stuff passed that it's like it sucks. I want to suck up to lobbyists and I want to make myself rich. And I want to pay and I want to pay down. hush money. She even included hush money. Yeah, I want yeah. to pay hush money. Uh-huh. I want to do a whole bunch of awful shit. I want to bribe people to shut up about it. I want to make myself rich. Um, and she goes down the list of things. Now, is, is it, am I allowed to do that under the campaign finance law? And, and the people in front of her say, oh, yeah, you can do that. Really? Okay. Well, now I want to take that money that I just got from a PAC. I'm 100% PAC funded now. The oil industry or the big pharma, is, is I'm completely owned by them. Can I take some of that money and use it to bribe people to shut up and make them go away? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can do that. It's called speech. Really? And she told a story. She mm-hmm. gathered people. Literally, it's a semicircle. Yep. Gathered them around the fire, mm-hmm. the most ancient form of communication, and told a story. And brought the audience in. What about this? Oh, yeah, yeah. And she knew what the answers were going to be. Oh, yeah. But it's the compelling way she framed the fucking narrative that makes it memorable. This could have been a boring recitation of campaign finance laws and why they fail. Right. But it wasn't. It accomplished exactly the same end, but it made the story memorable. And understandable. And understandable to anyone who did not understand legalese Mm -hmm. or constitutional rights or or even want to listen to five minutes of that. You, and this is what yeah. writers are good at. Yes, they let me, are. Let me just advocate for my profession. I, I, this is, by the way, this month is the 10-year anniversary uh, of me uh, getting laid off from the last full-time job I will ever have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which taught me a lot of humility along the way. It taught me about um, uh, not expecting the world to respond to what's to what I think is right, mm-hmm. which I think is a really valuable lesson for a white guy to learn. <laughs> um, and I, I sort of knew it. But now I really do know it down in my skin. So my real profession now is writer. I'm a writer. And writers do this. This is what, if I could just sit down the entire Democratic Party, I would teach them how to tell stories. And this is what Stacey Abrams did. Yes. She told stories. She told a story about her dad. She told a story about her life. And she had a whole bunch of, you know, touch points she had to get to, which is the plot of the story. I want to reach A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I want to break the story in such a way that it ends up with Walter White Chemistry teacher being Walter White, drug lord. How do I get there? But there's a craft to it, and it's something you can learn. And really, if you just took a little bit of time, if you're a Democrat, a little bit of time getting good at telling stories. You know who is good at telling stories? Donald Trump. Yeah. Donald Trump tells Actually, giant, yeah. scary, nightmare, live, completely made-up bullshit racist stories. And he, and he knows his audience. He knows he, he goes, oh, Buddha. There's a caravan coming over the border full of drugs and rapists. You know, that's all he needs to do because the morons who vote for him believe it anyway. So, he, But he knows how to tell these people. He knows how to drag their fears out front of the beds, put a face on it, which is liberals, and shove or it Mexicans, right back at them and say, Or the or whole caravan. The caravan is a story, yeah. right? Yeah. It is, yeah. But the caravan is a story of how Nancy Pelosi hates America. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's the story. There would Donald Trump doesn't give a shit about a wall or a caravan or this country or Mexicans or drugs or anything. He cares about power and money and keeping himself out of prison. And to do that, he has to stay in power. And to do that, he has to scare enough morons into voting for him or or rioting if anybody lays a finger on him. And to do that, he needs a boogeyman. Yeah. And he knows exactly which. And this is going back to rat fucking and Carl Rove and Lee Atwater and George W. Bush. All of them know how to invoke the nightmare scenario that's simmering right in the in the lizard brain of the republican voter and bring it right out in the open and now it's just out there yeah now it's not a biggest now it's not, it doesn't have to be encoded at all now it's just out there black people are going to murder your family mexicans are going to rape your daughter or that's, or at the this, very least be... steal your job yeah i mean that right. that is it that's the story it's and... not subtle at all yeah, anymore yeah. you know there's no encoding this is this is a story so they're telling their base a story and Democrats, again, God love them, like like burying the narrative under facts and figures, yeah. <laughs> which yeah. you don't need. You really don't need it. And so she did a magnificent job. They all did a great job, which leads me to the last issue. Um, Russian doll is terrific. Yes. And most people have already seen it, I'm sure, if you have Netflix. Right. Uh, right. But it, we wanted to thank uh, Bill W. 
for recommending mm-hmm. it to us. And uh, there's even a Dune reference in there. We aren't going to tell you what yeah. it is, but there's no. even a Dune reference in Russian Doll on Netflix. And to to uh, Chris M, who said, "Dude, how could you possibly fuck up and 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 mix up Dune Messiah and Children of Dune?" Uh, all I can say is truth suffers from too much analysis. <laughs> truth suffers from too much analysis, right? Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. But this week's Internet Kitty is actually a dog. Jolie is 13 years old and at 13 years old knows well enough to sit by the fire on a cold day. You should go visit Jolie at our Facebook page or website. You can send your Internet pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. Uh, We got our taxes done this week. We know people are getting their taxes done and people are all over the place as to whether they're actually getting a refund this year or not. If you're waiting for uh, your tax refund to come to send us your annual donation, some people do that. Uh, That's fine. We appreciate that. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal postal address information, you can give monthly, you can give uh, one at one time only, any way you want to do it. Uh, we've got Patreon, PayPal. Cash. Cash. Check. Check, cash, send scotch, send yarn. yarn. Send yarn, send, send yarn. scotch. Sure. <laughs> send books, send whatever. Uh, it's all there. All the information you need to contribute to the show is at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Driftless, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties were amused today by Matt Whitaker's Why Are We at the Vets face. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, and the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGBG Productions Incorporated.